I want to talk to you tonight about the topic of Jesus Christ. Who was he? When you talk on the university campus, there are two questions that usually come up right away. What do you say to the person who says, I'm an atheist? That's the first one. What would you say to a person that's an atheist? Maybe you're watching tonight, and you've watched the John Ankerberg Show for many, many years. We're going into our 11th year now. And I'm glad that you've been watching. But what I'm interested in is you coming to know Jesus Christ personally. And maybe you've thrown this as an excuse. I'm an atheist. Can I just talk with you a little bit? I don't think you can be an atheist intellectually. Why? Number one, if I was to say, prove it, what would you have to do? You would have to have all knowledge. Let me give you an example. You folks that are right here in the audience, if I was to say to you, what's going on behind you? You don't really know. You don't know if the person's just sitting there looking at the back of your head right now and wondering why you've got that kind of a hairdo. You don't know what they're thinking about. You don't know what's going on in the room across the hall or in Chicago or in London or in Tokyo. Or how about out in our galaxy? What about behind one of the planets? See, we don't have enough information to say, I've been every place and I know that God is not there. Because maybe God is behind you or in the next room or in Chicago, Tokyo, behind a planet, or maybe he's a spirit. And you haven't got a spirit Geiger counter to search him out. He might be right here. In fact, the Bible says he is right here and in all of those other places at the same moment. But the fact is, we would have to be in the part of the entire universe. We would have to be able to see the entire universe to say God's not there, and nobody has that kind of knowledge. And so most of our real intellectual people today, they don't say they're atheists. But that brings us to the second question, and that is to people that say, well, I'm an agnostic, John. Now, what's an agnostic? An agnostic is a fellow that's brilliant in the area of not knowing anything. Thomas Huxley coined the term. Now, there's two kinds of agnostics. First of all, there's the ordinary agnostic. What's the ordinary agnostic? The ordinary agnostic says, look, I don't know if there is a God, but if you've got some evidence, show me I'm open to it. And if you're an agnostic tonight, if you're watching tonight, I hope that's the kind of agnostic that you are. You're at least open to the evidence. But then there's the second kind of agnostic, and that kind of person is the ornery agnostic. He says, I don't know if there is a God, but I know that you don't know. And I say, how do you know? I know. That's the ornery agnostic. If you're the ornery agnostic, you're like this man. Did you hear about the man who thought he was dead? Did you hear about this? There was a man who went around saying that he was dead. His family would introduce him and say, here's our son. They'd give his name, and the guy would say, oh, by the way, friends, I'm dead. And that bothered the immediate family a little bit. So they thought, well, let's take him to a psychiatrist. They took him to a psychiatrist. They said, doc, our boy's got a problem. He thinks he's dead. The doctor says, bring him in. So the guy came in. He says, hi, doc, my name is. And he says, by the way, I'm dead. The doctor says, I see what the problem is. And so... The doctor thought, well, if I can take one fact from the real world and persuade this young man of that fact that'll break his worldview that he's dead, I've got him. So he thought, let's take the factual nature of blood. He says, here's the fact I want you to learn. Dead men don't bleed. The guy says, okay, and he took him down to the morgue and cut dead bodies, showed him they didn't bleed, showed him pathological textbooks and so on, and after months and months of study, the guy says, okay, doctor, doctor, you have persuaded me. Dead men don't bleed. The doctor thought, I got him, I got him. He says, stick out your finger. The guy stuck out his finger. The doctor took the little pocket knife and he jabbed it right into the finger and out spurted the blood of this kid. And the guy looked at that and he says, well, doctor, look at that. Dead men bleed after all. Now that just shows you that if you hold on to a view strong enough, no facts in the real world are going to bother you. And some ornery agnostics are like that. <coughs> See, and I don't want you to be. I want you to be open to the evidence. So you say, what's the evidence, Ankerberg? Get to it. Christianity is not a philosophy. Christianity is not a system of morals and ethics, although it encompasses that. 
Christianity is based on a person, Jesus Christ. Let me give you the conclusion of where I'm going to before we get there, okay? Here's the conclusion. Let's say that Jesus Christ was backstage, and I wanted to introduce him to you folks tonight. And I would say, now, ladies and gentlemen, in a moment, Jesus Christ is going to come out here and he's going to talk to you. And when he comes out here, he looks at you and he snaps his finger and this room disappears. He snaps his finger again, the world disappears. He snaps his finger the third time, the sun quits shining, the stars go black, and you and he are standing in utter space together. And he smiles at you and he says, hey, don't worry. Snaps his fingers again and brings it all back together again. That's who Jesus Christ is. You say, that's not the one I believe in. That's the problem. That's the problem. It's like the old TV show, will the real Jesus please stand up? We got all kinds of Jesuses running around America today. Now the question is, how are we going to find out who the real Jesus is so that you can do business with him? Let me ask you another question. How many of you here believe that Abraham Lincoln was the president of the United States at one time? Would you put your hand up? Great, that's great. Now, how many of you have met Lincoln personally? Would you put your hand up? I spoke at the University of Chicago one time, uh, graduate students, and there were three guys in the back that put their hand up. I got a little worried until I saw the smoke going up past their head, and uh, I knew where they were coming from. Well, if you've, never, if you've never met Lincoln personally, how did you know that he was the President of the United States? Well, one day you were awake in history class, and you can remember, you, you can remember, the teacher was talking about certain people heard what Lincoln said, they saw him doing the things that he did as president, giving his speeches, and they were eyewitnesses to his life. And they actually, some of them wrote it down. They wrote it down. And those bits and pieces of evidence from those eyewitnesses, historical material, information about Lincoln, is the proof that Abraham Lincoln lived. Now, going on back in history, there are other people. Do you remember good old Napoleon? I'll stretch you. Do you remember Charlemagne? Yeah, okay. And do you remember Julius Caesar? Right. And right about the time of Julius Caesar, another person lived by the name of Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know that? Well, you can check out the Encyclopedia Britannica, and it lists 20,000 words in the 15th edition to the person of Jesus Christ. That's more words about Jesus Christ than any other person that's ever lived and has been put into the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, why? Because the fellows that wrote it are such warm evangelicals, they just had to put Jesus in there? No, no. Every philosopher, every historian that's ever written about the first hundred years A.D. had to put Jesus Christ in there. Why? Because he's an actual historical figure that really lived just like Abraham Lincoln, Napoleon, Charlemagne, or Julius Caesar. How do you know that? Well, there were eyewitnesses that have given us evidence just like Lincoln and the rest. Who were they? Well, there were at least eight guys that wrote or said they had contact with the eyewitnesses. Who were they? Let me hear it. A little louder. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, no, not Acts. <laughs> Paul, okay, who else? Peter, James, and the writer of the book of Hebrews, right? At least. Now, immediately when you do that on campus, some folks will say, and maybe you're at home sitting there saying, listen, but those were the disciples. How do we know that we can trust those guys? I mean, didn't they just kind of pad the case? In fact, here's what most of our students across the country, this is what they hear. Professor Avram Stroll, University of British Columbia, said this in one of his lectures. It was picked up in the newspapers and it was touted across Canada quite a bit. He made this statement, and our kids hear it in the university all the time. Jesus probably did exist, but so many legends have grown up about him that it's impossible for scholars to find out anything about the real man. The Gospels of St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, and St. John were written long after Jesus was crucified. They provide no reliable historical information about him. It's almost impossible to derive historical facts from the legends and descriptions of the miracles performed by Jesus. People such as Avram Stroll, F.C. Bauer, Rudolf Bultmann, 
all claim the same thing. And now what they're really saying is, here's the deal. If I come down and I whisper a, a message into the ear of this lady right here, and she whispers it to the man next to her, and it goes all the way down the row, and then it goes all the way back through the crowd, and by the time it gets way back there to Dr. Gleason Archer, the message changed. And you see what they're saying? We've done that at parties, and you know how screwy the message is from here to there. Oral transmission down through the years, and all of a sudden you get back there, and it changed. See? And that's what they're saying. 200 years afterwards. Now the question is, is that true? Is that how the Gospels came down? Well, now, actually, take your Bible, would you? If you've got a Bible, and let's see what the documents said. What we want to find out is how and when the documents were written. How did they actually come down? What did the writers claim? Turn to Luke chapter 1 and take a look at it. Luke chapter 1, the first four verses, Luke tells us why he wrote the book, how he did it, what his credentials are for all that he said and did. Here's how it goes. He said, many have undertaken to draw up an account. Stop right there. You already got your answer. What did he say? Many have undertaken to what? Pass it along orally? Just to talk it out? Well, they certainly did that. But Luke said, many have undertaken to draw up an account. What kind of an account? Just like what he had done. Now, that puts a new stamp on this whole thing. If this lady here sees something and writes it down at that point, then what happens? She's an eyewitness. You see, that's the kind of thing we bring into a law court and a guy can get the electric chair if you have just one honest witness that says, I saw him do it. Luke says, many have undertaken to, to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. What's that? He's talking about life of Jesus, what he said and did. How do we know that? That's what he says in Acts chapter 1, the first couple of verses. He says, that's what I'm talking about, the life of Jesus. Therefore, since I myself have what? Carefully investigated everything. That's what the guy claims. He says, since I have carefully investigated everything, what did he investigate? Well, I skipped a verse if you saw it. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were what? eyewitnesses and servants of the word that's the apostles he says I've carefully investigated those eyewitnesses and their written accounts Luke didn't just accept them he checked them out now how did he do it he probably cross-checked them and then he went to those who were claiming to be eyewitnesses and said is this what you saw is does this jive with what you know that's what he said he did since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. I checked out the eyewitnesses, and I wrote it down. Why? So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So right off the bat, Luke burst the bubble of the profs at school that say this came down 200 years after the time of Jesus and the disciples and they all died it was all oral no the guys said we had contact with the eyewitnesses they wrote things down we checked their accounts and we wrote our own that's what he said now go over to the book of first John first John chapter 1 let's see what he said why did he write his book now you're gonna find he's got six we have either heard or we have seen statements in here six of them you can mark them. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld, that's the Greek word scrutinized, carefully investigated again, and our hands handled concerning the word of life, the word was with God and the word dwelt among us, the life was manifested and we have seen 
and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Do you get the idea that he saw something? And that's what he's telling you about? That's what I get. Peter talks to the critics today and says, guys, point blank, 2 Peter 1.16, we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were what? We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, if you don't think that that's just taking a few things out of, uh, of the text here and uh, you'll never find it again, turn over to Acts chapter 1 and uh, take a look at this. Acts chapter 1, verse 2. Yeah, let's start with 1 since we're close. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. I told you he said that. Until the day when he was taken up, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the which people to the apostles whom he had chosen to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them that's the apostles over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God what a teaching class by the Lord himself now did they get the point were they good uh, pupils in the class look at verse 8 Jesus says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. So that's his instruction. I've chosen you guys. That's what Peter said. He chose us. Now go out and be a witness. Now turn over to chapter 2 at Pentecost, verse 22. Peter's preaching, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst now Peter is preaching to other eyewitnesses he says listen guys you remember what we all saw and just as you yourselves know and he went on to preach about the things that they knew now hold on to that we'll come back to it verse 32 just skip over across the page chapter 2 verse 32 this Jesus Peter said God raised up again to which we are all what Witnesses, go to chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, the book of Acts. Peter says, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are what? Witnesses. Turn over the page to chapter 4. Verse 19 and 20, Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking what we have, what? Seen and heard. Verse 33, the same chapter, and with great power the apostles were giving what? Witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. You could go on and on and on. I just wanted you to get the flavor. What did the guys claim? They were there. They're the witnesses. No big deal, right? Well, the question is, how accurate were they? Right? How accurate were they? When you look at some of them, Sir William Ramsey was a professor at the German school at Tübingen who believed a lot of the things that uh, the scholars were saying in knocking the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he actually went into the Holy Land and started to do digs on the book of Luke. And he found out that... What Luke was saying was absolutely true, and he could hardly believe it. In fact, he wrote the book, St. Paul the Traveler, and in that book he said that Luke was not only a good historian, but he was probably the best historian of that day. We have found out through archaeology that Luke cited facts about 32 countries, 54 cities, 9 islands, and several rulers and he never made one mistake now if you can check out a guy in that many facts and he never makes one mistake then you can count on him for the stuff you can't check let's talk though for a moment about the time they were written okay because this has a little bearing on it when were the books written when did they come out 
If they didn't come out 200 years after the time of Jesus, when did they come out? William F. Albright at Johns Hopkins University was considered the foremost biblical archaeologist in the world before he died. And after studying the documents and looking at these texts for, for all of his life, at the end of his life, he came to this conclusion. He said, every one of the books that we've got in our New Testament, including Matthew all the way to Revelation, every one of the books was written by a baptized Jew sometime between the time of 45 to 75 A.D., probably, he says, 50 to 80, most probably. Now, what does that do for you right off the bat? Well, let me, before I tell you what it does for you, let me give you another guy. Dr. John A.T. Robinson was the lecturer at Trinity College, Cambridge, and one of England's most distinguished critics. He was a liberal. And almost as a theological joke, he was challenged to look at the documents and reevaluate them again. And so he did it. And he was shocked at what he found out. And he started using words like this. He said, owing to scholarly sloth, the tyranny of the unexamined assumptions, and almost willful blindness by previous authors, much of the past reasoning was untenable concerning the dates of the Gospels. When did he say that they were written? He came out in his book, redating the New Testament, and he said that the whole New Testament was written before 70 A.D. And he challenged his colleagues to prove him wrong, and they haven't done it yet. Now think about this for a moment. If Jesus died about 30 A.D., and some of these books started coming out 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, and they were all on the newsstands in Jerusalem by the time of 75 to 80 A.D., the longest time span there between 30 and 80 would be 50, and the shortest would be 10 to 15 years some of them were on the newsstands. Now you say, what difference does it make? It tells me that we got true, accurate information. Why? Now I'm going to ask you a question and see if uh, see how many people are really old here tonight. How many of you are 30 years of age or older? Would you put your hand up? How many of you are 30 years of age or younger? Okay, most of you guys 30 years of age and younger won't know what I'm talking about. But I'm going to see if the other crowd does. Okay. Now, here's the deal. Let me ask you a question. Where were you, and what were you thinking about? What did you actually feel? Who was around you when you heard these words? The President of the United States has been shot, and you were talking about John F. Kennedy. How many of you can remember where you were at, what you were doing? I can remember. It just takes a moment to bring that back. Do you remember what it was like, what you felt when you saw Jackie Kennedy coming off the airplane with her pink dress splattered with the blood of the president? Do you remember watching the casket roll down the streets in Washington and, and drawn by the horse, and you saw John John and the family walking behind, and John John came up to the, to the, to the cemetery, and he stood at salute? Do you remember that? Do you remember how you felt? Yeah, you can. What if somebody came out today and says, here's how Kennedy died. He was uh, driving down the streets in Dallas, and he was in this big limousine, and there was an Indian standing on the sidewalk, and this Indian took the bow and shot the uh, arrow right into Kennedy's head, and that's how he died. You would say, no, that's not how it happened. Why? Because you were an eyewitness via television, or a couple months back, I was speaking in a downtown church in Dallas, Texas, four blocks from where Kennedy was shot. And I was using this illustration, and all of a sudden the church went absolutely quiet, and I thought, what did I say? And I realized that those people were reliving it, and some of those people that were right there, they were over there four blocks, and they had watched that happen. Eyewitnesses. But you know what? How long ago did that happen? 28 years ago. 1963. And you can still bring back the very emotions that you had when you heard those words and when you saw those pictures. 
hey guys, come on, the New Testament documents about Jesus were on the newsstands 10 to 15 years only after the time that Jesus had passed off the scene. And the people hadn't all gone to heaven with them. They were around. And it was both friends and enemies. And if somebody had said, listen, Jesus landed in a spaceship from Mars and he stepped off and this is how it happened, they'd say, no, why? Because they were there. F.F. F. Bruce at Manchester, before he died, he said, You've got to remember there were people that loved Jesus that looked at these documents and if they had seen anything in those documents that was wrong, they would have pointed it out because they loved him. There were also people that hated his guts. And they looked at those documents. You remember Mark chapter 2? Put that in your head and think about it for a minute. Mark chapter 2. A real spot, Capernaum, right? And what happened? Jesus is preaching and the religious high leaders are there. And the place is jammed out. And what happened? They ripped up the roof and let a guy down. Now, those are kinds of meetings I think you and I would remember, right? I've never been in one of those where a guy came right straight down. <laughs> now, all the scholars say Mark was the first book on the newsstand. And all those people, both friends and enemies, could remember back to what Jesus did in Capernaum. And what did Jesus do? He said, hey, fellow, your sins are forgiven. And everybody went, whoo, shouldn't have said that. Why? Because that was a claim to deity. And they called him on it. And what did Jesus do? He didn't back away. He said, in order for you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, something that you can't see, let me do something that you can see. And he said to the man, stand up and walk. And the man stood up and walked. And he says, because I've done that which you can see, now you better trust me that I can do this too. He didn't walk away from it. And that's in the early document. What if that didn't happen? I mean, that's just a sitting duck for somebody to point out and say, hey, come on, this is screwy stuff. But all the scholars say that Matthew and Luke borrowed from that guy, Mark. So it must not have been too screwy. In fact, nobody, nobody ever doubted the documents in that day. Remember, that's what I just showed you. Peter was preaching. He says, you remember when it happened? He was preaching to other eyewitnesses. That didn't mean they were Christians. Other eyewitnesses that had to admit, yeah, that happened. That tells us we've got accurate information. The dates, the time that these books came out is too close. There couldn't have been any legend. There couldn't have been any messing with the documents. Some people say, but you know, you guys don't have very much information. I mean, when you take other historical books in ancient history, I mean, you guys just don't have good, good, solid information. Is that right? Let me ask you a question. How many of you would think that your classical teachers, when they taught you about Aristotle, thought that they didn't have good information about Aristotle? You know how long it was between the time that Aristotle wrote and the first manuscripts that we have in existence that are left? Aristotle wrote between 384 to 322 B.C. The earliest copies of his writings that we have in existence, they date from 1100 A.D., which is a 1,400-year time span from the time that he wrote the original autograph, the original copy, and then they were copied, and all those copies were destroyed along the way. So there's nothing all the way for 1,400 years. And 1100 A.D., we have the first copy that tells us there's this guy called Aristotle that wrote. And there's not one classical scholar that's going to tell you, hey, we don't know what he said. Plato wrote 427 to 347 B.C., the earliest copy that we have in existence from him is 900 A.D., a time span of 1,200 years in between. Thucydides in his history wrote between 460 to 400 B.C. Earliest copy we have is 900 A.D., a 1,300-year time span. In the New Testament, what do we have? The John Ryland's papyri, the papyrus that they have, is dated about 117 A.D. If the books were written between 45 to 80, from 80 to 117, 40, 37 years, 37 years versus 1300? The bottom of papyri are marked at 200 AD, give us major portions of the books of the New Testament. 
But then you can go down to the Chester Beatty Papyri, 250 A.D. Again, major portions. You can go into the whole books of the New Testament when you get down to 325 A.D. Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, dates from 350. You got the whole New Testament. Within 250 years, 300 years of the time that Jesus and the apostles lived, the fact is you have the whole manuscripts, 200 to 300 years, versus some of the greatest works in classical ancient history, 1,300, 1,200 years. By the way, how many documents do we have of Plato, Aristotle? The works that we have in existence that we can check out what he said, before we get to how many he's got, let's find out why it's important. If you have ever had an exercise in your, your, your classroom where the teacher says, here's a chapter of a book, I want all 100 of you to write it. Just write the whole chapter. So you all write it, and then you collect the papers, and you find out some guys made mistakes on certain words or punctuation, certain guys spelled wrong. Some, some people, they skipped the line. But when you took all 100 of the copies together, not everybody made the mistake in the same spot. And so if you put them together, if you wanted to find out what that original chapter really was, if the teacher kept that away from you, if you put all those hundred together as you would examine them, you would find out, well, this guy made an error here, and there's 99 guys that say it, 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 it's this way over here, so this guy's got to be wrong, so you go that direction. And, you, and the more manuscripts you have, the better chance you have of finding out what the original chapter was. Now, if you only have two guys, and they both make errors, and it's especially in the same spot, you've got a pretty tough time. So the more manuscripts you have to check out, the better chance you have of reconstructing what it is that was the original. Now, how many do we have when you get down to uh, a manuscript such as Aristotle? We have thousands of manuscripts. In existence, we have exactly 49 manuscripts. 49. For Plato, we have seven. Seven copies. Sophocles, 193 copies. Thucydides, eight copies. If you ever go into uh, the classics, you'll find when you study Catullus, three copies. Three copies. That's it. Lucretius, two copies. I haven't heard one classical scholar say, from those two copies, we don't know what the guy said. What's the second best attested book in ancient history in terms of manuscripts? Homer's Iliad. You know how many copies we have for the Iliad? 643 copies that have come down to us. Now, for this bad old New Testament that we have, how many copies do we have over there? We have 24,633 at the last count. Do you get the idea that somebody is biased here? That's why the principal librarian of the British Archives, Frederick G. Kenyon, said this, the interval between the dates of the original composition of the New Testament and the ex earliest extant evidence, the documents that we have in our existence now, becomes so small as to become, in fact, negligible. And the last foundation for any doubt, any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written, has now been removed. Both the authenticity, he said, and the general integrity of the books of the New Testament may be regarded as finally established. You've seen people in Time and Newsweek talking about these scholars such as Boltman and Bauer and, and people like that we were reading to you that it's come down 200 years later. Those guys haven't, gotten, they haven't caught up with the evidence. And I think they're ornery agnostics. They don't want to look at the evidence, but the evidence is there is what I want you to know about. William F. Albright said about some of those critics, only modern scholars who lack both historical method and perspective can spin such a web of speculation that it came down 200 years later and it was legend. Bruce Metzger at Princeton said, the works of several ancient authors are preserved to us by the thinnest possible thread of transmission. I just gave you that thin thread. In contrast with these figures, the textual critic of the New Testament is embarrassed by the wealth of his material. F.F. F. Bruce said again, there's no body of ancient literature in the world which enjoys such a wealth of good textual attestation as the New Testament. Now, let me give you one other fact. Did you know you could burn all 24,000 of those documents 
and you could still reconstruct the entire New Testament. From what? The first 200 years after the time that Jesus lived, the Christians would take those New Testaments and those books and they would quote them in their own writings and letters. The writings of the church fathers in the period of time, 200 years after Jesus lived, the British Museum went back and they found 89,000 quotations that puts together the entire New Testament except for 11 verses. All I want you to know is we've got accurate information about this guy, Jesus. A real historical figure. Now, I'm not taking the book as a book that dropped out of heaven. It is inspired and inerrant. I believe that, but I'm not starting there. I'm saying, look, if you're going to throw out the Bible, you're going to have to throw out all of ancient history because there's more attestation for this than for that. And I haven't heard anybody on the campus yet that wants to throw out Aristotle and Plato and Sophocles. And that just gets me to what I want to talk to you about. If we've got accurate information about Jesus... What do those documents say? Three areas I want to look at with you. Number one, his claims. Number two, I want to look at his character. Number three, I want to look at his miracles. Okay? See, I don't, need, I don't think you need to know Greek and Hebrew to be able to find out that Jesus claimed that he was God. Do you know that? Now, it's come up in every debate. But let me give you a little more information. What if your kid, mom and dad, came down to breakfast one morning and he said, Now, gang, gather around here. I want to tell you some news. And then he said, Are you listening? I am the light of the world. He that follows me, you'll never walk in darkness again. Dad would say, sit down, Junior, eat your breakfast. See, that's an egotistical claim. We all realize people don't go around saying that kind of stuff about themselves. Who's the light of the world? Listen to what Jesus said. You tell me who you think he was claiming to be. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life in John 8, 12. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Notice the emphasis on the personal pronoun that Jesus keeps referring people to himself. Muhammad Buddha, Gandhi, other religious leaders all pointed people to somebody else. Jesus said, look at me. Who do you think that I am? He went around asking the disciples. And it wasn't because he didn't know. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus said Abraham had rejoiced to see his day. Moses had written about him. The scriptures as a totality, bore witness about him. According to Jesus, men were to confess him above all others. They were to obey him before all others. Jesus said to know him was to know God. To see him was to see God. To believe in him was to believe in God. To receive him was to receive God. To hate him was to hate God. To honor him was to honor God. In Mark 2, like we talked about, Jesus claimed he could forgive men's sins. In John 11, he claimed he would be the one that would give eternal life to men. He claimed that his words would never pass away. You mean Shakespeare and Catullus and Lucretius, we're going to forget all about them, but we're going to remember you, Jesus? That's what he said. He said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. In the Sermon on the Mount, what did he say? You have heard that it has been said, thou shalt not commit adultery. What was that? Where did that come from? That was one of the Ten Commandments. The Jews believed God gave it right straight to Moses. They all knew that. And then Jesus said, but I say unto you, and everybody's mouth probably dropped right open. 
Why? When God says something, you don't go and say, now let me add a little something to that. Because when you do, you're making your teachings equal in authority with God. They all thought, well, he'll, he'll correct that in a minute. And then he said, you have heard that it has been said, thou shalt not murder. But I say unto you, if you just hate your brother in your heart, you've broken that law. That's why when you come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it records this. The people were amazed. Why? Because the man taught as one who had authority. You better bet your boots he did. The very authority of God and not as the scribes. One I kind of am interested in, Matthew 15. Jesus claimed that someday he's coming back at the end of the world and he alone will determine the eternal destiny of every man, woman, and child that's ever lived. Now, that's what I call a hairy statement. Not only will Jesus be the judge, but men's destiny will depend on how they treated Jesus in the past. Did they believe on him? Did they acknowledge and confess him before the world? Jesus said, those who have denied him, he'll deny them. In fact, for a man to be excluded from heaven on the last day, all that needs to happen is for Jesus to say, I don't know you. Now think about that. You know some things about Jesus. You also know some things about President Bush. That doesn't mean you know him personally. What I want to know tonight is, as God looks at you, does Jesus say, I know that person? Or does he know that you have never come to him and said, I'm a sinner? I'm going to accept your free gift because you died on the cross and shed your blood for my sins. I accept your gift by faith. You've never said that. And Jesus knows it. And he says he'll be the judge. When everything is said and done and the world is wrapped up, you're going to talk and face him. I'd like to ask you right now, what will Jesus say about you? That's what got to me. Jesus said in John 8, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. What's the matter? Jesus, your grammar bad? No. He was referring to Exodus chapter 3, where Moses was at the burning bush. And God said to Moses, I am who I am and thus you shall go and say to the sons of Israel I am has sent me to you and furthermore my name my memorial name for all generations will be the I am and Jesus quietly appropriated that and said to the fellows in John 8 I'm the I am that's why they picked up stones to kill him did they understand the people that were listening to him, what Jesus was claiming? In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The Greek word tells me that it's not the fact that we are one in purpose, but we are one in essence, the very nature of God. Whereupon the Jews picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. John chapter 5, 18, we read this. For this reason the Jews tried all the harder to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. That's what the record says. They understood what he was saying. Those are the claims of Jesus Christ, just a few. You didn't know any Greek, did you? Did you catch on to what he was saying? Then look at his character. If you want to have a real short conversation with your friends, get around a cu cup of coffee and sit down with them and say, now let's spend this next half hour and let's talk about what Jesus did wrong. Be a real short half hour. On the other hand, let's say, Dad, that you got the family around you and you said, now, family, uh, I'd like for uh, you to tell me, is there one thing that I've ever done wrong just write it down on the paper there. Kid would say, can I have more paper, Dad? <laughs> we wouldn't say that to our family. Jesus said that to his enemies. Which one of you can convince me and convict me of one sin that I've done wrong? 
Nobody could. Now that puts Jesus in a different boat than all the rest of us. Think about that. If the guy never did a thing wrong, then what's the matter with him? No sin. He was absolutely perfect. Think about that. Listen to what Jesus said in his teachings. According to Jesus, all other men were lost sheep. He alone had come as the good shepherd to seek and to save them, John 10, 11. All other men were sick with the disease of sin. According to Jesus, he was the doctor who had come to heal them. All other men were plunged in the darkness of sin and ignorance. He was the light of the world, John 8, 12. All other men were sinners. He was born to be their savior and would shed his blood in death for the forgiveness of their sins, Matthew 26, 28. All other men were hungry. He was the bread of life. All other men were dead in trespasses and sins. He could be their life now and their resurrection hereafter. That's what he taught. He also possessed this keen spiritual radar. I don't know how else to say it. When he looked at other people, he could see when there was hypocrisy. He saw it among his own disciples. And he pointed it out and he said, that's not the way it's going to be among you. And he wasn't afraid to focus that radar, that spiritual radar of what was right and what was wrong, even on the religious leaders of his day. He went and said, your snakes in the grass, your whitewashed sepulchers, your hypocrites. So he had this fantastic standard that he applied all around and wasn't ashamed or bashful to do it. But you know what? When he focused that radar on his own life, he never prayed one prayer and said, God, forgive me. Now that's interesting. You know why it's interesting? Because if you think about it, the liberals and the critics today about Jesus Christ who say that he never was God, he was just a man. Last night we heard he was just a prophet, but not God. All of these people, as they look at people down through history, if you look at St. Augustine, if you look at Luther, and you look at Calvin, and if you look at people like John Wesley, and if you look at Moody and Finney and Billy Graham and other people, the closer all of those men got to God, what did they notice? Their own sinfulness. Their own sinfulness. Read Augustine in his Confessions. Read Luther. David Brainerd was a young man that was one of the first missionaries to the American Indian. And Brainerd was Jonathan Edwards' son-in-law. And this young man went to the American Indians. He would ride on horseback. He would sleep on the ground. He was day after day witnessing and trying to win the Indians to the Lord Jesus. He died at 29 years of age because of such a rough life, laying on the wet ground, not having warmth, good food, spending his energy. This guy used to pray for four hours every morning. He kept a diary. And I mean, when you look at what this guy did, I mean, Edwards and everybody else thought, man, if there was ever a saint, this is it right here. They read, Edwards read in his diary where Brainerd said, after his prayer time, what a worm, what a wretch. Oh, look at the sins of my life. And he would detail the sins of his life. Because in his prayer time with the Lord, the closer he got to the Lord, the more he saw his own failures. That was true of the Apostle Paul, the other apostles, and the greatest men in church history. The closer you get to God, the more you see your own sin. Now take that. If Jesus was only a man, only a prophet, then follow that rule according to the critics. He lived closer to God than anybody else. But if he did then he, if he was only a man, should have seen his sin more than anybody else, and we should have seen and heard those prayers. But we don't. We see just the opposite. Which of you can convict me of one sin? Nobody could. 
absolutely unique, absolutely unique. Now, what would you consider being in that kind of a person's presence? A guy that says, I'm the light of the world, he can create and he can do all these things and he can forgive sins. What kind of a personality do you think he would have? Most people that are perfect or try to think they're perfect, they're kind of stuck up, right? You don't want to be around them. They're proud. They're not humble. But isn't it interesting that this guy who claimed to live a perfect life, absolutely sinless, is also considered by the skeptics to be the greatest example of love and humility that's ever walked the earth. Now, how do you figure that out? Well, what would you do if you went to his friends? If anybody should have known what Jesus was like, it would have been the apostles, right? What did Peter say? Peter described Jesus as a lamb without spot or blemish. He said Jesus committed no sin, no guile. There wasn't even deceit found on his lips. 1 Peter 2.22, the apostle John said, In Christ there is no sin. And this was the apostle that said... All men are sinners, and if we say we have no sin, we are liars, and we make God to be a liar too, in 1 John. The apostle Paul said about Jesus, Jesus knew no sin, rather he was holy, he was blameless, he was unstained, he was separated from sinners. The writer of the book of Hebrews said, Jesus was in every respect tempted as we are, yet without what? Sin. Pilate, after examining Jesus, he could find no fault with him, and he publicly washed his hands of Jesus' blood. King Herod said, I can't find anything wrong with this man. Judas, the traitor, filled with remorse, returned the 30 pieces of silver and said, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. The penitent thief on the cross said, this man has done nothing wrong. The Roman centurion, having watched Jesus suffer and die, exclaimed, certainly this was a righteous man. But yet there was no touch of self-importance. He was not pompous. He was not proud. He knew he was Lord of all, but he became our servant. He said he was going to judge the world at the end of time, and yet he sat there and he washed the feet of the apostles. He made friends with simple fishermen. He touched the lepers, and as the cruel spikes were being driven through his hands, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What do you do with that kind of a person? The last thing I'd like you to take a look at is not just his claims and not just his character, which are absolutely unique, but look at his works. Remember the old uh, TV deal, Hawaii Five-0? Remember that wave? About a 20-footer. And, and when I was in Hawaii, I found out that if, if you get caught in one of those 20-footers and it comes down on you, it pushes you right down to the gravel and you've got 20 feet of water above you. And then while you're swimming up, there's one of these other 20-footers that's coming behind that one. So you don't do a lot of swimming in that. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee, okay? They're on the Sea of Galilee, and a storm comes up, comes off of the mountains there, the wind blows, and they're in their little fishing boat. Interesting enough, Jesus is sacked out in front of the boat. The waves are coming in. Picture the disciples, so much afraid. Their faces are pale. Finally, James says, look, Peter, you've got to do something. Go down and wake Jesus up. So Jesus goes running down there. And he says, now look, Jesus, wake up. Grab a bucket. We've got to bail out. We're, we're going down here. It's an Anchorberg translation here. <laughs> Jesus gets up walks up to the side. He looks at the men and says, Oh, ye of little faith. Right, Jesus, grab that bucket and get, get going. Jesus sees these huge waves coming in. He knows those fishermen think they're going to die because you don't do a lot of swimming in those kind of waves. He sees the wind. And all he does is he goes over to the side and he says, Peace, be still. Hey, James, did you hear that? Now, I mean, that's really going to help us out, isn't it? I mean, and the wind stops, and the waves start 
to calm down and finally they're just lapping up against the boat. And there are those fishermen standing there with their buckets in their hand, dripping wet, looking at each other, looking around. And you know what? One of the things that tells me that the account is true is they said the exact same thing I would have said if that had happened and I had been there and watched it. Peter looks over at James and he says, Who is this guy? <laughs> See, that would get your attention. People don't go around talking to the elements, and the elements obey them. But Jesus did. And he didn't do miracles like a magician pulling rabbits out of a hat. He always had a purpose. I used to speak on the university campus a lot during the Vietnam War, and some of my friends actually came home in a box. One particularly dreary funeral, a young guy by about 22 years of age was being lowered into the ground, and it was a drizzly day in Chicago. There's only a couple of us standing there. You talk about depressing. And I thought, what would it be like if Jesus came? Put it in these terms. What if a guy walked up and said, what are you guys so blue about? Well, you see, uh, our friend died in Vietnam. 22 years of age. Life was cut short. Kind of sad about it. He says, well, listen, I'll tell you what. You see those shovels over there? Go get those shovels. Come on back. Dig and get the dirt out. Well, why do you want to do that? Well, just, just do what I tell you. So you go over there. You're crazy enough. You go over, get the shovel. You, you start digging down. You dig all the dirt out again. And you pile it up right next to you. Now the guy says, pry the cover loose. Well, wait a minute. We don't want to do that. I mean, the body stinks. Just do what I tell you. So you pry the cover loose, but you keep it closed. You jump out of the hole. You're all standing around looking and got the dirt piled up, and this guy's over here. And he says, what's the guy's name? Let's say the guy's name is Harry. Okay? He says, uh, Hey, Harry, come on out of there. And you look and you say, you mean we did all of that for you just to say, hey, Harry, come on out of there? I mean, come on, fella. And while you're saying all of this and kind of putting the needle into him, you got one eye on the casket, and you're noticing that the cover is starting to come open. And all of a sudden, a hand comes out, and then all of a sudden, Harry sits up in the box... He stands up, and then he crawls out of the grave, and he's standing there next to you, and you're looking at Harry. What do you say? Hey, Harry, how was the trip? I don't know. <laughs> and the guy that says, hey, Harry, come on out of there, he walks away, and he says, listen, he looks a little cold, get him some food and stuff and take care of him. And you're saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did you do that? And where are you going to be when I die? Houdini pulled off a lot of tricks, right? And he said that a year from the time that he would die, he would come back. He'd pull that one off. And all the reporters gathered with his wife on top of the roof of the building that he had, he had named. And what happened? Houdini pulled off a lot of tricks, but he didn't pull off that one. And who's the guy that we were talking about kind of symbolically here? It's amazing. In all the Hollywood movies, they fudge on most of the miracles, and there's only one they always usually keep in there. What is it? Lazarus. If Jesus can pull off that one, I want to talk to Jesus. Because every one of you, you're going to die. And it was after Jesus said, hey, Lazarus, come on out of there. And they all laughed at him until Lazarus showed up at the opening. It was then at that time that Jesus said, now you saw that? Remember what I told you just before I did that? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though you die, yet you're going to live. If a guy gives that kind of proof, friends, I don't know what you're looking for. But the final thing that Jesus said, anybody can claim anything, but Jesus said, the proof that I'm going to give you is just like Jonah was, was, uh, went into the belly of the great fish and came forth on the third day. So shall the Son of Man go be put into the earth, and on the third day he'll come forth. Right, Jesus. Just like some of you saying, John, I don't feel too good. In fact, in a few minutes from now, I'm going to fall off in the aisle completely dead. 
And I'm going to lay there for about, oh, four days. Don't worry about it. After four days, I'm just going to sit up and come back to life again. And I'll say, well, I've never seen that before, but I'm willing to watch. Jesus said, listen, fellas, we're going to Jerusalem, and when we get there, they're going to take me, they're going to try me, they're going to flog me, they're going to crucify me, you're going to bury me, and third day I'm coming back from the dead. <laughs> right, Jesus. They didn't understand what he was talking about. Jesus did go up to Jerusalem, and he was captured. Six trials later, they condemned him for blasphemy because he was again claiming to have the prerogatives of God. They put him on a cross, and they nailed him there. They knew what they were doing. Jesus died. He gave up his spirit. He said, no man can take my life. I lay it down. And he gave his spirit to the Father. And then the Roman centurion came along and just to make sure, jabbed the spear into his side, and out came the blood with water. He was dead. They took his body. They wrapped it. They had a strip, a cloth. And they would put a layer of spices in. They would put another strip of cloth, and they would mold it to the body, and they put 75 pounds of spices, just like a mummy, except for the top of the head, the body. They took, and then they put it into a tomb, and they put a two-ton door, stone door, over the front of it. They sealed it. They put the Romans stamp on there that meant you don't mess with that. If you do, we'll kill you. And they put Roman centurions to guard it. And Roman centurions, they didn't mess around either because the only failure or the only punishment for failure under duty was death. And that cuts into your schedule and so nobody would mess around. Now all that took place. That's historical. Nobody argues about that. Except how could it be that just a few days later in that very city that had watched Jesus be murdered, how could those disciples talk to all those people and say, hey, Jesus is alive. Believe on Jesus. And why did 3,000 of those people that watched him get murdered, why did they believe on him? There's two facts you always got to take a look at. Number one, the tomb was empty. That's a historical fact. It's not a theological one. Everybody admits it's, it's empty. Why? Because if the, the disciples are standing two blocks over saying, listen, Jesus is alive, nobody would have believed them if they could have walked two blocks over and looked at the body laying there in the tomb. Right? They had to be empty. But it, was the, it wasn't the disciples that said it was empty first. Did you know that? Who said it was empty first? The religious leaders and the soldiers. The soldiers knew it was empty, went and knew they were in big trouble, and they went to the religious leaders and they told them. And I'm sure that they went and checked it out because they gave money to the soldiers to pay them off to come up with this story and to spread the story, namely that while we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. And so they went out and told that. But they did it so fast, they concocted it so fast, they had a little error in their thinking. If you say to me, John, last night I was sacked out of my house, and while I was sleeping, my next door neighbor, Pete, came over and he took my TV set. And I would say, well, if you were sleeping, didn't you have your eyes closed? How'd you know it was Pete? <laughs> while we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body away. Well, if you were sleeping, how'd you know it was the disciples? A little flaw in their logic there. The tomb was empty. The second thing that you have to look at is you have to look at all of these disciples, it said, when Jesus had, was captured, what happened? They fled. They fled. They were cowards. Peter denied Christ. Now they're standing up in the very city that had crucified Jesus, ready to take the heat themselves, and they're saying, Jesus is alive. What changed them? Something had to change them. What did they say? We saw Jesus. We saw Jesus. He rose from the dead. He said, we're to be witnesses for him. That's why we're here telling you. That'd be a pretty powerful motive. The basic main theory today to counteract that one is the theory about they were hallucinating. Now think about that for a moment. If 
the record said that Mary and Peter and John, they were in this little back room, and it was dark, and there was a little candle there that was glowing, but they were in hiding, and the doors were shut, and all of a sudden, the, the wind blew, and the curtain went up, and it blew out the candle, and all of a sudden, Mary said, oh, ha! saw Jesus. Oh, and Peter says, great, that's great, that's great. Let's go tell everybody. I'd be a little worried about that. Where did they see Jesus? They saw him down at the beach in the morning. They saw him on a busy road. They were all together having dinner, and Jesus appeared in their midst. Jesus appeared to them over and over and over again. You know why I think he did that? I thought about this a long time. I think the reason he did that was they didn't even trust their own eyes the first time they saw him. You think about what those guys were going to have to go and say. You wanted to be mighty sure that that wasn't just a bad lunch you had. <laughs> and they touched him, and they ate, and they saw him, and he appeared to them in all kinds of different situations until they were fully persuaded, and that's what they said. We saw him, we looked at him, we heard him, we scrutinized him, we did everything, and we want you to know the same guy that was put on the cross is the one that was put into the ground, and he arose, and he's living now, and we've seen him. He also appeared to skeptics. He said, I didn't know that. Yeah. Do you remember a fellow by the name of Thomas? He says, I won't believe. Peter says, listen, we've seen him, we've seen him. I don't care what you've seen, Peter. I won't believe until I can see his body. I want to put my hands right into the place where the nails went into his hands, and I want to see where the spear went in. I want to put my hand there. I want to check it out, and until I do, I ain't going to believe. Is that a believer? a skeptic and the guys were together in the room and Thomas was there and Jesus appeared can you see that meeting Thomas is trying to blend in with the woodwork and the wall here <laughs> Jesus is hey Thomas over here check out my hands check out my side and he did and Thomas the skeptic said my Lord, my God. Now let me ask you. We've got accurate historical information about this person called Jesus that actually lived. Can't get away from it. You can't just close your eyes to it. He's there, just like Lincoln, Napoleon, Charlemagne, Julius Caesar. The problem is with this accurate historical information about Jesus, the eyewitnesses all quote him as saying, I'm the light of the world, I'm God. And he didn't commit one sin, he lived a perfect life. And he did these miracles that really fascinate us because we're going to die and we are interested in a person that will say, I can give you a resurrection and life forevermore. I've got the power to pull that off, and he demonstrates it. So what's the real reason that Jesus came? He said, the Son of Man has come to give his life as a ransom for many. What's a ransom? I had a friend in Minneapolis. His wife was kidnapped. And the people that took his wife wanted $250,000 ransom and they said that they would give her back. And he got the money, and he dropped it at the right place, and he bought back his wife. He got her back. A lot of times that doesn't happen, but in that case it did. The ransom to get her back. Jesus said, the ransom, me. I've come to give me for your sin so you can get off the hook. I have come that you can have life, but you got a sin problem. And remember this, if you were to face Jesus right now, would you still have that sin problem, or has there ever been a time when you have come to him and said, I've got it, I don't want to keep it, I want to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I'll accept your gift of forgiveness that you provided when you went to the cross? When Jesus was on that cross, your sins and mine, every lie that I've ever told, every lustful thought we've ever had, 
everything that we've ever done in cheating or stealing, whatever the sins of our life have been, were all picked up and they were placed right on Jesus. And the Bible says when he was on the cross, God made him to become sin for us, the one who knew no sin. In his own body on the cross, he paid for our sins. He's living now. He's conquered the grave. And he says, all of you who will admit that you're a sinner, he says, I want to give you forgiveness. I want to have a relationship with you. I love you. I want to come into your life. I want to empower you. I want to be your friend. I want you to walk with me. Do you want it? Do you want it tonight? You can have it. I'd like you to bow your head and close your eyes. Every head's bowed and every eye's closed. Jesus said someday he's coming back at the end of the world and you'll stand before him. My question is right now, does he know about you? Does he know you? See, it doesn't depend on whether or not you just know a few facts about him. The question is, does he know you, and does he know that you have come to him and said, Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner, and I turn from my sin, and I accept your free gift. I accept you. I want a relationship with you, very God. I'd like to give you an opportunity, those of you that are listening via television and those of you that are in this room. I'm so concerned about you you might have been watching this program for many, many years, and you've thought this applies only to other people, but that's not true. This applies to you. You're one of those people that Jesus died for. He loves, and he wants to forgive, but he doesn't force his affection on you. He waits for you to recognize you need him, you need his help, and to admit that you're a sinner. Would you do that right now? Would you be willing to place your faith in him? You don't have to know all of how he's going to do it, just the fact that he promises he will do it for you. He says he'll put the Holy Spirit of God into your life. He'll change you. He will make you a Christian. He'll change your desires. If there are sins of drugs or of lust or whatever is binding your life and ruining your life, Jesus Christ can change you from the inside out. He's got the power to do it. Not you. He does. But he waits for you to come and say, Help! I believe on you. I commit myself to you. Would you do that tonight? So I'll put it to you very succinctly. If you would say, I am willing to admit to Jesus that I'm a sinner, and I believe that the evidence is there that shows he claimed to be God, he lived only as God could live a perfect life, he loved only as God could love, and he did miracles only because he was God, then would you let that wonderful Lord Jesus come into your life tonight? Would you trust him completely? I'm going to say a prayer. And if you would like to start a relationship with Jesus yourself, right where you're at, if you're listening at home right now, I would like for you to say this prayer, either out loud or just quietly. If you're here in the audience, you can just say it in your heart and your mind to God. He'll understand, but just say it and mean it. Here's that prayer. I invite you to start that relationship with the Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit that. I've broken your laws. I need your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross and you paid for my sins. And right now, put all my faith and trust on you. I turn from my sin to you. And I would ask that you would put your Holy Spirit in me and right now you'd make me a Christian through your own great power. Thank you. And thank you for promising that your gift includes not only the forgiveness of my sin, 
But when I die, you will bring me to heaven. You're the resurrection and the life. That's your promise. Help me now to walk with you, to know what the next steps are. But thank you for making me a Christian. Everyone that's here, before you raise your head, if you prayed that prayer, and I've been praying for some of you that are here tonight, that tonight would be the night that you would absolutely make that commitment to Jesus Christ with no reservations and ask him to be your Lord and Savior. If you actually said that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, I'd like to be your witness tonight. And you could witness that you made that decision and prayed that prayer by simply putting up your hand right now, high enough that I could see it, holding it up, saying, I prayed that prayer. I want you to know I see all these hands. God bless you. God bless you. Especially you men, God bless you. Just put it up and then put it down. I'm so glad. If you prayed that prayer at home and you're watching wherever you're at, Drop me a card. Tell me that you started that relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd like to know. Let that be your way of telling me I made that decision. We'd like to send you some information of how to get started right with the Lord.